rights violations. How advocacy and activism pave the way for rights and dignity. Salil Shetty, Amnesty International. When the wall came down, I was in India, thousands of miles away from Europe. But the news from Berlin had a powerful impact. It provided a global message of hope. Maybe you only had one Indian. Here you're getting a second Indian. But we are 1.2 billion people, so it's not a bad ratio. Um, I wanted to start this morning's uh, conversation by asking you to join me in a small simulation exercise. Um, you all have these blindfolds in your seat, so could, could I request you? It's going to be very short. It will mean some minor discomfort. Uh, so please put this on and cover your eyes fully. Um, and as soon as you're ready, we, we're ready to go. If you don't have a blindfold, just cover your eyes. Try and make sure you're not able to see much. Let's get the sound, please. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for indulging me in this. Um, it's really just to give you a sense of how people experience uh, torture on a daily basis in many, many parts of the world. Essentially, a combination of darkness and uh, intolerable noise is a very old uh, practice of torture, one of many which governments use. What I wanted to let you know is that this is not a relic from medieval times. Unfortunately, in our last annual report, we identified that there are 112 countries which still practice torture as we speak. And thousands and thousands of people experience this on a daily basis. Somebody was telling me that it's like one of the nightclubs in Berlin, <laughs> uh, but much worse. Think of this sound, and it's hundreds of times multiplied. That's the experience that people go through on a daily basis. If you look at uh, the statistics around the world, we have 57 countries today who continue to lock up people who don't agree with the governments, people who have a different identity, a different belief system. 80 countries conducted unfair trials. 101 countries repressed people's freedom of expression. And 31 countries forcibly disappeared people. Uh, the number of refugees, the number of stateless people is just mind-blowing. So somebody asked me recently, um, so don't you get depressed? How do you do this job if so many bad things are happening on a daily basis? Uh, and I say to them that actually uh, my job is fascinating because on the one hand, yes, you, you see depressing things all the time. On the other hand, you meet people who are, despite all odds, standing up against injustice, fighting for their rights. And that's the incredible story that I see every day. And there are so many people like you who support those who are suffering from abuses. You may not be suffering it yourself, but you stand with them. You take injustice personally. Uh, of course, there are many people who say that you know, nothing can happen. And to them, playwright Bernard Shaw said, uh, people who say it cannot be done should not interrupt those who are doing it. And that is essentially the story also of Amnesty International. And I, I'm coming to Margaret Mead in a minute, who said that never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Now, the Amnesty International story, which you may have uh, heard of, is the story of the candle. And Peter Benenson, who created Amnesty International, uh, he said there are two choices. Either you can curse the darkness, or you light a candle. And the, and the story of Amnesty International is of uh, small groups of people coming together. Uh, very different from what uh, Bhagwati, Justice Bhagwati, I mean, uh, Professor Bhagwati said. It's not about sitting and clicking on something, but it's actually groups of people coming together in villages and schools and colleges on streets. Um, and 
Before we knew it, we had three million people across the world who came together to make this massive people's movement. Uh, that allows us the freedom of not accepting money from governments and corporations and remaining completely independent and impartial. Somebody asked me, what are you doing in a science and research conference? Funny enough, Amnesty International is in some ways a research institution because a lot of our time goes in researching the facts. We have to get our facts absolutely right because politically the questions we raise are so sensitive that it has to be credible and impartial. Uh, one of the great success stories of recent times, just to give you one example of what Amnesty did, uh, was the creation of the Arms Trade Treaty. And this campaign for creation of a treaty to regulate the flow of arms, to prevent it from reaching the hands of human rights abusers, went on for 20 years. And when we started this campaign, of course, everybody said, this is naive, you're dreamers, it's unrealistic. Even at the beginning of this year, when I was in New York for the negotiations, senior diplomats said, this is not going to happen. But it did happen, and the story is essentially that ordinary people coming together can create extraordinary change. Uh, one of the things which Ai Weiwei said just a few years ago, and I thought since we just heard him, and we obviously work closely with Ai Weiwei, Liu Xiaobo, and many of the Chinese uh, freedom fighters, he said, imagine the hateful world around you collapses, and your attitude, words, and actions, your attitudes, words, and actions have brought it to an end. Would you be excited? The answer is obvious. But this is the story that we see all around us, and this is what keeps us going. Like the women in Saudi Arabia who are challenging the ban on driving. The people of Myanmar, uh, you know, I, any of you know Burma or Myanmar, even three years ago, if you told us that the country would see the freedoms it's seeing today, uh, you would have thought it's impossible. Some of the long-standing dictators, Gaddafi and many others in the Middle East, have toppled. Of course, it doesn't mean that all these countries are now suddenly seeing a land of milk and honey. There are many, many challenges. But what we are seeing in the world today is a time of unprecedented change, which has to inspire all of us into positive action. Now, the question that we've been asked today is, which are the next walls to fall? And my answer to that is very simple. I think the way in which all the human rights violations walls are going to fall is by connecting the dots of inspiration inspiring action and courage and the resistance to injustice that we are seeing across the world by creating a truly global people's movement for human rights. One of the things that we always hear is that human rights is a Western construct. And the only way we're going to challenge this is by saying, no, this is not true. But there are many steps needed in order for us to get to this point. First and foremost, the West itself needs to stop uh, saying one thing and practicing another thing. The United States has to close Guantanamo Bay. They have to stop invading the privacy. <laughs> they have to stop invading the privacy of people. And Europe, uh, and we'll come to Lampedusa and what we're, here, what we're seeing in Europe now, but Europeans are now very upset that you know their leaders' phone calls are being intercepted. They didn't really mind when other people's calls were being intercepted. Uh, <laughs> And Europe really has to uh, also start practicing what it preaches. The fact of the matter is that more and more of this is coming to light, that so many countries in Europe have been complicit with the disappearing of people through the extraordinary rendition program of the CIA. So uh, we, we have uh, serious violations of European law and international law when it comes to asylum seekers and refugees coming to this country. Uh, the most egregious one is of Syria. As you know, Europe pushed hard for the Assad regime to stop violating human rights, rightly so, but the consequence of that is that millions of people have been pushed out of their homes in Syria, and when they come towards uh, Europe, they're pushed out again, pushed back into the land which is persecuting them. I know that Sweden and Germany have, been, uh, have agreed to take some refugees, but overall, it's really peanuts that we are talking about. So what is, the, what is the way forward? This is a f our favorite institution, the Security Council, which is charged with securing world peace. The fact of the matter is, as we speak, there is a complete leadership vacuum at the global level and a do complete deadlock in terms of global decision making. If you think about it, if you leave the arms trade treaty aside, the climate talks, the trade talks, the nuclear talks, Palestine, everything is stuck at the global level. And why is this? If you take Syria again, it's a classic divide. The West and the United States against the Assad regime, 
Russia backing the Assad regime because they are one of their biggest uh, buyers of arms and it's a big strategic important location for them and China always backs Russia by and large. Now this is not an unfamiliar story but think about all these new emerging countries Brazil, India, South Africa, Nigeria, Indonesia. What are they doing? Are they showing the leadership that they should? Because they claim to be demo uh, democracies and champions of human rights but all they do by and large is hide behind the big boys. Either they hide behind the United States in the West or China and Russia, depending on their convenience. And why is it that they get away with this? In my view, the, way they, the reason they get away with this is because they don't have a constituency in their countries holding them to account. I can assure you that in South Africa, if most South Africans knew how the South African government uh, votes in the UN, they would be appalled. It's equally true for my country. So what we are doing in Amnesty is to change this to build this movement in emerging economies. We've launched Amnesty in India and Brazil. In the last one year, we launched one campaign in India to raise the whole issue about the number of Tamils, the thousands of Tamils who've been killed by the Sri Lankan government and LTTE. And just with that one campaign, we've had almost two million people joining that campaign in India. We've also launched, a, and this is the kind of movements which need to be created in Africa, India, etc. cetera. Uh, this is the visit recently I made to uh, Brazil Again, Amnesty Brazil is really beginning to get a lot of traction. Uh, this is with communities from the indigenous uh, people. Uh, and you can see that uh, the, these communities are making a big difference at that level. Uh, and so where, can Amnesty do all of this on its own? Of course not. We are totally dependent on people like you, which is why I'm here today to talk to you. The science community can play a very crucial role. Uh, we're already working with them on satellite imagery, mobile phones, internet. It can be a real force for good. So you could become members, you could become supporters, you could sign up to our campaigns. This is our German website. We're doing a big campaign in the run-up to Sochi um, to really push hard on Russia to start respecting human rights. So uh, there's not going to be enough time to make it interactive now, but uh, here's a, a bespoke, specialized email address. If you guys want to talk, if you want to understand more, please write to us. I want to end by showing you a video, partly because I don't need to be here, then I can run away and he can't stop me. Um, <laughs> but we, I want to end on a lighter note to show how Amnesty is so deeply embedded into popular culture as well, and that's Hollywood for you. Thank you. <laughs>